Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so welcome everybody to Core Materials, Better Concrete, Better Steel. The session dives into the two highest impact materials in the building sector, concrete and steel, and explains why they're carbon intensive and how to reduce the embodied carbon of concrete and steel today through design and specification. Uh, the learning objectives for the session are shown here and we'll be following up with a survey um, with more information on how to receive credit from the AIA. We'll also be collecting questions submitted to the Q&A box throughout the session. Um, so if the speakers aren't able to get to your questions, we'll have them answer uh, later on and then we'll post that to the Carbon Positive website after the teach-in. Um, so with that, uh, so welcome everyone. My name is Lindsay Rasmussen. I'm a senior program manager with Architecture 2030 and I'll be uh, playing a bit of a moderator role here today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers for the session, Sam Chin and Margaret Hansborough. Um, up first, we'll have Dr. Sam Chin, a materials engineer with Arup. Sam, ha Sam has extensive knowledge on concrete sustainability and durability, having 21 publications in academic journals and international conferences, and having worked on multiple large-scale infrastructure projects in Austra Australasia for Arup, uh, diving, driving for better sustainability and durability in concrete. Uh, following Sam, we'll hear from Margaret Hansborough, Director for Mighty Earth's Groundbreaking Steel Industry Campaign. She has authored two steel industry reports, Cold Steel, Hot Climate, and Construction Deconstruction, and has led campaign activities that resulted in the largest steel company in the world to produce the first ever steel industry climate report and commit to carbon neutrality for its European operations. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah, all good. So thanks everyone. I'm Sam Chen, a materials engineer from Arup in Melbourne. Today I'm here to talk about a low carbon concrete. And everyone knows about concrete. It's a traditional but modern material. Poland cement concrete has been around for uh, nearly 170 years. It plays an important role in our modern times. It is an important material because it is the second most consumed material in the world. We produce nearly 75 billion tons of concrete per year nowadays. It also has a significant impact on our environment. Concrete industry alone and takes up about 8% of the global carbon dioxide emission. It sounds very terrible and it is not just the problem of carbon dioxide. We are also facing the problem of high energy consumption. We are also facing a shortage of natural resources in many regions and because we are turning our planet into a concrete jungle. In the construction of buildings and the infrastructures, embodied the carbon in concrete mainly comes from its production process. There is also carbon dioxide from the transportation and there are also carbon dioxide from construction activities. And these are the three main carbon dioxide sources you get when you use concrete. And there is a report uh, published by Australian Greenhouse Office the study was conducted to evaluate the carbon dioxide emission factors from each of the stage, uh, concrete production and concrete transportation and the construction. And from this table, you can see that nearly 98% of the carbon dioxide is from the material itself. Transportation and associated site activities only have about 2% impact. And however, nearly 74.1% of carbon dioxide uh, comes from cement. When you produce one ton of cement, you will also produce 0.8 tons of carbon dioxide. It is nearly 30 times more than the embodied carbon of fly ash. So we know what the problem is here in concrete. It is all because the cement. I probably need to remind you that we're only talking about concrete here, but we also have reinforcement in concrete, which is not shown in this table. Steel is an energy intensive material with high energy embodied carbon as well. If we consider the impact of steel in reinforced concrete, it accounts for 10 to 20%. And I think Margaret uh, today will talk about the impact of steel uh, specifically later today. And before we lay out our strategies to solve the problem uh, of concrete, we need some targets and we need specific ambitious, but also achievable goals. Paris Agreement sets a target of 40% in body carbon reduction in 2030. And in Europe, 
we also have we also made a commitment and we will strive for net zero carbon in 2030 and how to achieve these goals from material perspective we need to make our concrete more low carbon and more eco-friendly there are many ways to to achieve them i listed three pathways here in my presentation today which i believe they are very easy to achieve so pathway number one reduce the use of cement we have various alternative uh, materials to replace cement in concrete. We call them supplementary cementitious materials. I've listed eight of them here today. Um, actually, there are more than that. So first we have fly ash, also known as pulverized fuel ash. It is produced from burning pulverized coal in electric power generating plants. Normally you would replace 20 to 30% of, uh, of cement in concrete by fly ash. And we also have slag, and which is a byproduct from the uh, blast furnaces used to make iron. And it has a replacement level between 30 to 70%, depends on its quality. And silica film, a byproduct of, a, uh, a byproduct of the smelting process in the silicon and ferrosilicon industry. It is commonly used when we need high strength concrete. Its dosage is usually around five to 10%. It's because it has some impact on concrete workability and it makes it difficult to place on site. And these are the three main SEMs that are most widely used alternative materials for cement. And you can find a lot of research about them. And apart from them, we also have uh, metacaline. It is one of the most effective pozzolanic materials. It is a product that is manufactured for use and it, rather than a byproduct. It is formed when China clay, the mineral kaolin, is heated up to a temperature between 5 and 800, 500 and 800 Celsius degrees. It has a beneficial effect on concrete per, uh, performance. And normally you would use 20 to 30 percent of it in concrete as cement replacement. And natural pozzolans, and they are generally sourced from natural minerals and volcanic deposits. Some natural minerals require calcination the heat treatment to transform them to pozzolans, and for example, clay and shale. So we also have calcium, calcined natural pozzolans. Limestone, uh, limestone powder can be used as an inactive filler in concrete with around a 10% replacement in concrete. And also we have bio-based materials such as rice husk ash. However, uh, it is localized to countries where you have a strong rice industry, such as China, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam and the US. And you can also mix and match all these SCMs in concrete. And in terms of their replacement and in general in Australia, the business as usual is 15% replacement. And in most of the projects uh, in the past 10 to 20 years, 25% cement replacement was regarded as a good practice. And however, the potential of reducing cement is up to 65 to 75%. If we can achieve 65 cement replacement by using the materials listed here, for example, you can achieve a further 40% reduction in embodied carbon compared to the business as usual case. And also there are some other benefits of using these alternative materials because uh, they can improve concrete durability performance generally. And the pathway number two, and use non-virgin materials. We are facing with the issues with waste materials right now. Concrete is excellent in incorporating these waste materials, sequestering them in structures. And here are four recycled materials that are easy to use in concrete. Um, manufactured sand, recycled concrete, recycled glass, and recycled plastic. For manufactured sand, 50% replacement is a good practice. And it reduces the use of natural river sand because in many places, they are running out of river sand, for example, like Sydney. And the recycled concrete, normally we would use 10%. And it is widely used in Singapore now. Uh, for recycled glass, and it can be used as fine aggregates in concrete with a 10 to 20% replacement level. Uh, also, we have recycled plastic, and it can be used as fiber reinforcement. Uh, so we can reduce the use of steel reinforcement. It is also worth mentioning that using these recycled materials does not necessarily mean the embodied carbon in concrete will be reduced because reprocessing these waste materials involves carbon emission as well. So however, the recycling 
reduces the exploitation of virgin materials, which is also beneficial to the environment. Pathway number three, um, there is a new type of concrete, geopolymer concrete. Geopolymer concrete consists of aggregates and water like conventional concrete. However, in geopolymer concrete, we don't need cement at all. And what we need is only fly ash and the activators. The activators there is to induce the chemical reaction, which provi uh, provides us the strength. But sometimes we also uh, add some slag and uh, cement in geopolymer concrete in order to improve some specific performance. It is called geopolymer um, because its hydration products are in 3D structure. The hydration products are from the reaction between fly ash and activators, activators like uh, sodium hydroxide or sodium silicate. The performance of geopolymer is similar to conventional concrete. I can say that there is no difference if it is designed properly. It even has better performance in marine environment than conventional Portland cement concrete. If we look at the embodied carbon in geopolymer concrete, we, we can see fly ash based geopolymer is only 10 to 20% of the embodied carbon in Portland cement concrete it is very significant reduction. Uh, uh, these three pathways are very achievable and these technologies are ready there and mature in most of the areas. But what are the actions we need to make zero carbon become a reality? And I have a three stage approach here. Stage one, preparation. Set out the targets before we start a project. We need targets that are very specific, trackable and also ambitious. You know, we don't live in an ideal world. We don't always get what we desire. So we need to make these targets ambitious sometimes in the beginning. And to be able to use uh, low carbon concrete and new types of concrete or recycled materials, you need first be familiar with your local markets and the local supply chain. It sounds very simple, but this step is, uh, involves a lot of work and it is very critical. If we don't have the solid understanding of our local markets and the, the solid understanding of the availability of the material we need and the readiness of the technology in the region, we won't be able to bring it into our projects. And also we need to engage with the suppliers and the manufacturers as early as possible to ensure they're ready when the project starts. The last one in preparation is to address concerns. I think that's what most of our engineers do. And it can be technical issues and construction problems or financial costs. A strong communication strategy is very necessary. And the workshops with architects, multidiscipline engineers, and asset owners can also help to educate them on how to implement low carbon concrete and to bring them confidence to, in achieving low carbon outcome. And stage two, implementation. We need to turn our goals into reality. So first, we need to optimize design. It has two parts. We need to optimize our structural design and also our concrete design. We need first to ask our structural engineers how to maximize the reduction in concrete volume. Can we reduce the thickness of the, of the concrete cover? Can we use less reinforcement or can we use fewer columns in this structure? We need to ask these questions and the structural engineers will probably come back to us and say, or they need concrete with this and that kind of performance to achieve what you want. Then as, a team, uh, as material engineers, we can say, okay, we have these options available for you because we've done our preparation work. Then we can optimize our materials to achieve structural requirements with low carbon outcome. And meanwhile, we need to do as many concrete trials as we need until we are confident uh, in this low carbon concrete. Sometimes, Tests will take a very long time, around two to three months before you can use the mixed design. And that's why we suggest engaging with the local supply chain as early as possible. The last one, uh, to simplify specification. There are always external restrictions for your projects. For example, uh, for infrastructure projects, there are many different kinds of authority specifications you have to comply with. And for building structures, and there are some national standards and the international standards which are very prescriptive. And or in some, in some applications, you can't even find a related national standard for your specific concrete design. In all these situations, at least, uh, all these situations will limit the use of low carbon concrete. And in all these situations, 
you need to negotiate with the authority. You need to talk with your clients and to provide them with the confidence in your low carbon concrete. And then you can simplify the concrete specifications with the specific and the performance-based sustainability requirements. And once the low carbon concrete designs have been agreed, it should be documented on drawings. So they will be uh, trackable and element specific. And the stage three, completion. And we need to track the entire process, calculate the entire embodied carbon and optimize the outcome. If you find a new low carbon concrete very successful in your project and you find it very easy to implement, then share your experience and knowledge. And then you can even push it and make this low carbon concrete become benchmark benchmarks in your region. If we all do it in this way, I think a zero carbon target will be very tangible. And apart from sustainability, and one more thing I'd like to emphasize is the durability. And I think it is even more important than sustainability. When we think about sustainability, we normally focus on how much material we can save and how much energy we can reduce. But we sometimes forget about the whole life cycle of the materials we use. And our goal, I think the ultimate goal, is not only to just make concrete more low carbon, but also to make it more durable. And how to balance the sustainability and the durability in concrete is a very big topic. And you need material engineers to sort it out for you. Or you can ask me today or send me an email if you have any, uh, some interesting ideas to share. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sam. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and hand it over to Margaret. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yep, yep. and your screen Excellent. looks good. Okay, great. Um, we'll get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, and thank you, um, Sam, for that fabulous presentation. Um, I've had the pleasure to present alongside um, uh, some of your, your global colleagues at AREP. And, um, you know, I think uh, you set the tone there with your, your last slide of, um, you know, uh, implementation and uh, target setting and, and completion and, and what this looks like in practice. Um, and then also, you know, uh, what it looks like for your company to have a company committed uh, to net zero by 2030 is incredibly ambitious and incredibly necessary. So, so thank you for that uh, and setting the tone. Uh, so my name is Margaret Hansbro. I'm with an organization called uh, Mighty Earth. Um, we are, um, sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Um, we are a global campaign organization that works to protect tropical forests and oceans um, and fight climate change and protect the climate. Um, a lot of our campaigns have focused on, uh, on the effects of deforestation uh, driven by global agriculture. Um, and for a few years now, about two years, we've been working in the, the heavy industry space and specifically working on the issue of steel um, and uh, decarbonization of steel. Um, a lot of our campaigns, um, we work um, to really um, assess and, and make the risks of um, climate and environmental pollution uh, known by industry and to industry and, and, and throughout their supply chain um, and push for the kind of targets that um, Sam mentioned that his company has signed up for in terms of very ambitious um, climate and environmental targets. Um, and then through that, hopefully moving the private sector towards a, a more of a policy realignment um, in the different countries that, that, we, that we work in. We're, we're a US-based organization, um, but we have um, uh, members of our team based all around the world. Um, so as I mentioned, um, our, our, um, as Lindsay uh, mentioned in the intro, um, I've been working on, on the issue of steel decarbonization for a few years now. Um, and our goal is to really transform steel, uh, transform the entire global market um, and set a new uh, standard for um, low and zero carbon steel making um, and get companies um, and steel makers to commit to carbon neutrality. Um, some of our work to date is focused on um, one of the biggest companies in the world that's probably well known to you, ArcelorMittal, uh, based in, in um, headquartered in Europe, but with operations all around the world. Um, and is responsible in and of itself, just that company for um, about 
0.8% of uh, uh, global climate emissions just by by itself. Um, and so it's, you know, steel, um, you know, as an industry, it represents about somewhere between seven and, and 9% of global emissions. Um, so right on par with, with uh, cement. Um, and, um, you know, part of uh, one of the, what we try and do with, with our campaigns is, as we mentioned, really uh, push the front, um, front and top companies um, like Arcelor and in the U.S. we have a company called uh, Nucor, which is um, a, a top company um, that um, set, push them to set um, new and, 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 and more ambitious targets um, and, and move uh, the market uh, towards lower carbon um, uh, production. Um, we also, um, you know, early on we realized that um, construction uh, was about 50% of all global steel uh, uh, consumption. Um, and so it was going to play an outsized um, role in um, moving that supply chain um, towards more ambitious climate targets. And so uh, we also uh, focused on um, embodied carbon and um, the top performers and top green building companies um, in the US and, and globally to try and activate them towards um, setting uh, similarly ambitious targets. Um, so let's do a little bit of kind of level setting for, for global emissions around steel. As I mentioned, steel is around seven to nine percent, kind of oscillates depending on production year and and, and who you're quoting. Um, but you know, it stacks up um, pretty sizably with some of the other heavy industrial materials like aluminum, uh, chemicals, petrochemical, and, and cement. Um, but we also know that um, it's projected to, but along with cement, to, to grow um, significantly through more infrastructure and more building um, over the next many years. And so. Um, you know, the, the International Energy Agency, uh, responsible for a lot of um, global um, energy and climate models, um, they're, you know, even they're um, not as ambitious, um, and I'll talk about this in a little while, a two degree uh, warming scenario um, would require uh, more than a gigaton of reductions um, between now and 2050. Um, and so that, that's an enormous <laughs> set of, um, of a of, of reduction that that needs to happen and um, uh, we uh, really are only at the the outset of um, some of the major transformations that that need to take place um, within the steel um, industry um, and so one of the things I try and, and, and tell audiences particularly um, uh, who, who work for, for companies and and um, whether steel producers or in the construction or the auto sectors is that um, the business as usual scenarios are over, that no longer exists. Um, and so um, it's really about challenging business as usual and um, thinking through how to decarbonize uh, not just your, your project or your product, um, but your entire business strategy. Um, so a little bit of baseline setting around global uh, steel supply and demand as well. Um, important to note, um, obviously, you know, um, China has an outsized both uh, production um, in terms of the supply and demand. That was, of course, not the case 20 years ago, but it's grown um, just, you know, exceptionally in terms of its market share, both on the production and the demand side. Um, but all of, of kind of, you know, what you would consider um, the Asian region um, would be um, almost 75, 73% uh, of all uh, global supply and demand. And so um, when you talk about reducing uh, emissions from steel and, and uh, you really have to uh, have a very focused and targeted effort um, in all uh, new uh, construction and new consumer goods like autos um, and, um, and, and, and the production uh, in, in China, in India and in Japan and Korea. Um, and growing even more in Southeast Asia uh, recently as well. Um, and so as I mentioned, you know, it's important to talk about um, where, where the carbon is. Um, if you look at about kind of how steel is made, it's made two different ways um, that you, you're probably familiar with, that, that old blast furnace production method that, that your mind conjures up when you think of steel making. Um, and that was uh, uh, in the, the first image of, of my slideshow. Uh, where you're putting coking coal and, 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 and producing iron um, and forging new primary steel, new virgin steel. And um, 
that is about 70 to 72 percent of all global steel. Um, and then the other ha or the other portion is electric arc furnace or electric electricity produced steel, which is where you melt down scrap in an electric arc furnace with a large amount of electricity um, and then introduce um, uh, you know, new metal elements to, to, to create secondary or recycled steel. Um, and that could oscillate, you know, how much recycled content versus um, uh, non-recycled content that, that goes in there, depending on basically global availability of, of raw materials like scrap or iron ore. Um, but um, for the most part, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very scrap dependent um, and, and, and effective um, both on, on the cost and the emission side. EAFs are inherently less energy and, and, and CO2 intensive. Um, and so as um, the growth of EAF production has, has um, uh, grown over the last 20, 30 years, that has allowed for, to some degree, a more natural um, uh, decarbonization pathway within the steel industry, both because um, it saved on costs um, and then secondarily saved essentially on energy and emissions. Um, that being said, it is still very electricity dependent, and so it matters where your electricity comes from, and I'll, I'll get to that momentarily. Um, but in terms of, of where the carbon is and where the, the biggest chunk of, and, um, and uh, uh, where we need to focus our energy in terms of global steel transformation, it really is on these blast furnaces because they're so much more carbon intensive. Um, and that it's really important that um, we have a portfolio of solutions that can address um, the, those, those global assets. And so you'll see um, in terms of, uh, this is a recent study that was published um, this year um, and was, was completed last year um, that really talked about the efficiency um, globally of blast furnace, uh, blast furnace production. Um, and you'll see Japan is kind of right in the middle of the pack um, Korea towards the back and quickly followed by China in terms of CO2 intensity of the blast furnace production, uh, blast furnace, uh, uh, production. Um, and these are national averages per country. And so knowing kind of the intensity both of um, whether it's an EAF versus a blast furnace, uh, where your steel is coming from is, is important, but also um, knowing kind of what the country of origin is, there's going to be a different national average um, of, of, of CO2 intensity. Um, important to also note that to achieve a 1.5 degree scenario, which is what the carbon positive, the, the, the um, target framework that, um, that Lindsay and Ed and, and, and all of their team are presenting here as a part of this teaching, is a very aggressive scenario and very necessary scenario. Um, but in order to achieve that 1.5 scenario, specifically for steel, we need multiple parallel pathways. Um, so, you know, multiple solutions being deployed um, and all of it <laughs> will be needed to um, slowly and then hopefully much more quickly uh, displace coal burning flat blast furnaces uh, and mitigate steel climate pollution um, through other means. Um, a little bit of base lighting here in terms of, of some of the big players um, in, in, in Asia. As we mentioned, you know, it's 70 plus percent of all steel consumption and production. Um, China in, ranks first, India um, quite a bit further behind, but staged to grow enormously in terms of their capacity uh, to produce steel um, in terms of the, the projected models. Uh, Japan third and Korea six. Um, and then I have kind of the, the split there based on what some of the, the domestic um, steel trade associations um, provide in terms of um, percent of blast furnace versus EAF. Um, in India, they also have something called ele electric induction furnace, um, which is similar to electric arc furnace, just slightly different and slightly more energy intensive. Um, and so in, in China, actually, you'll, you'll see it's, it's actually a fairly low percent of, um, of EAF, um, but that also it's a, a much larger country. And so they, they you know, of course, there, there's still that 6% um, is a lot of electric arc furnaces comparatively to the rest of the globe. Um, also important to note that the relative age of, uh, of, uh, of, of the blast furnaces in China is, is, is younger. More of them have been, made, have been uh, built in the last 20 years um, than in some of the other countries. And so um, they also have um, the ability to, to um, use more scrap within a blast furnace. So 
uh, important to not conflate um, uh, energy and, and, and CO2 savings uh, by using scrap instead of uh, virgin uh, materials like um, that are typically used in blast furnaces because um, with, particularly with some newer blast furnaces, it's actually um, fairly easy to use a, a higher and higher percentage, some up to 40% um, in blast furnaces um, using scrap. Um, and so um, important not to conflate the two uh, um, there. Um, in India, it's actually a much more electricity dependent um, market there and, and their um, breakdown between blast furnaces and EAFs is actually similar to the US's breakdown. Uh, Japan, uh, much more blast furnace dependent and, and Korea um, as well. Um, some of the top producers in the region, I uh, put some of the, the logos and companies up there. Um, Baowu is number two in the world, um, an enormous producer, uh, very powerful uh, steel producer. Um, uh, HBIS group, Shingang group, um, in India, Tata Steel um, is, is very dominant and of course is a, is a regional uh, player as well, uh, and JSW. Um, in Japan, uh, Nippon Steel is a really important player. Uh, I think they're the number three producer in the, in the world um, and um, they um, have a regional influence as well. Um, important to note, uh, pardon me, so important to note that when it comes to um, steel, it's really also important to understand kind of where the, 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 the mined material comes from um, for steel. Um, you know, it's an exceptionally high amount of all mined material, um, mined metals on the planet you know, eventually go into steel, um, whether it's um, iron ore, coal, um, or the literally 100 different metals um, that are used either, you know, a teaspoon at a time or a ton at a time in steel production. An enormous amount of the mined metals around the world go into steel production alone. Um, and so uh, when you start talking about steel, you start talking about mining's um, effect on, on the world as well. Um, so we always think about, you know, steel is, is different than, than um, um, perhaps, um, you know, different than the energy industry, but in reality, it actually is one of the biggest users of electricity um, and energy, but also um, one of the biggest users of, of coal, right? Um, blast furnaces, um, they, they, they use coal to produce steel. Um, and about 30% of global coal use is used for industry. Uh, so not the thermal coal that's used for, for power plants, um, but for that industrial heat and combustion um, for processes like um, blast furnace production, cement production, and some other, a few odds and ends in terms of other industrial production processes. About 21% of global industrial energy use is steel alone. Um, and so within the heavy industry ind industry group, steel is, is, is the dominant player. Um, also really important to know that, you know, this has an effect on kind of, you know, the domestics uh, uh, issues of where some of these resources are coming from. Uh, China is the, the number two producer of iron ore and the, the number one producer of thermal and industrial coal. A lot of times they'll be grouped together like that. Uh, India uh, also similarly uh, fourth and third in terms of, of, of iron ore and coal um, and, um, Australia actually um, is the number one producer of um, iron ore um, and number four producer of coal. So in terms of you know, regional export and import, um, this is a big effect on, on the regional economies and, and connections between countries um, in the region. Um, I'll go back a little bit to the International Energy Agency for, for a moment um, and, and um, really kind of set up that, you know, one of the things that they have projected is exceptional growth in terms of um, steel and other heavy industrial demand um, for mostly for infrastructure uh, and buildings um, in the coming uh, 10, 20, 30 years between now and 2050. Um, and you'll see, you know, a, still an enormous amount of growth is expected in China, but India and um, other parts, particularly Southeast Asia, are expected to grow at an even more rapid rate. Um, you know, those are what the models say. 
that's what um, the business as usual scenarios uh, project. Um, but it, it, if that happens um, and, and um, you know, nothing is really done uh, to, to mitigate um, some of, and, and we'll get to this in a moment, some of the, the solutions that are needed on steel, um, there's no way that we can achieve a 1.5 degree scenario. Um, and the IEA itself is kind of fall, is really falling short of being able to um, set more ambitious scenarios in and of itself. Um, right now, they still, they still have not produced a, uh, a 1.5 degree uh, scenario or outlook for steel, for heavy industry, uh, for energy use broadly. Um, and so um, it becomes a little bit more challenging uh, when the um, agency responsible for setting uh, kind of the, the bar in terms of, of, of energy models and climate models um, doesn't produce a, a, a model that's ambitious enough to even begin to benchmark against. Um, and so we need, we need a 1.5 degree scenario uh, for steel and, and for, for, for all um, energy use uh, uh, from the IEA. Um, and one of the big differences that I'll point out is that the IEA uses models and projections of where they think the economy could go and, and where um, you know, they think that um, um, you know, climate, um, uh, tech, climate technology and clean technology uh, could yield in terms of, of reductions. Um, but what Carbon Positive and what Architecture 2030 did was they used the actual carbon budget that scientists have said um, is, um, is left in terms of, um, uh, you know, humans' ability to, to um, produce uh, uh, climate pollution um, uh, at, at this point. And so um, they're kind of coming, coming at this from the similar kind of issue of target setting from, from a different uh, a number set essentially. Um, and so I think it's exceptionally important to kind of take that, take that note that one is about models and projections. Um, and then you look at carbon positives framework and, and target setting. Um, and it is derived from a real carbon budget um, that climate scientists have, have, have validated um, and, and have said, this is essentially how much um, more pollution the world can afford. I also think it's important to, to note that where uh, growth in steel demand is um, expected to um, grow um, are many of the same places where sea level rise is uh, likely to um, be the most devastating. Um, this is my, my not so great attempt to take a screenshot um, of a, uh, something called the Climate Central Coasting Mapping Project. Um, and, and I, I can, um, uh, if, you, if you Google Climate Central Co Coastal Mapping Project, you'll, you'll come up with this map and, and you can create your own. But, um, you know, this is uh, a scenario um, just at two degrees, at two degrees warming. Uh, and, and you'll see that most of the major cities in Southeast Asia um, and along um, some of the most populous places in, in, in China um, are, are going to be essentially underwater um, by, by 2050. Um, and that's at a, a two degree scenario, um, affecting approximately 300 million people. Um, and so, you know, we, on one hand, we have the IEA saying, you know, there's, there's going to be global uh, growth and global demand for steel um, throughout uh, Asia and particularly in Southeast Asia. And on the other hand, we have climate scientists saying, a lot of those places are going to be underwater. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really imperative um, as uh, global design professionals and leaders to really think about um, where, where you're going to be building and then also what materials you're going to be using as well um, and how actually those two things play into each other. Um, construction's ability to reduce its emissions um, is going to be essential um, and, and aggressively so essential um, to avoiding some of these worst effects of climate change that we're talking about. All right, so this is probably what everybody is most interested in. Um, as, as you all know, and, and I, you know, my, my role as a climate campaigner, I, I'm not a, a, tech, a technical um, expert in terms of, of, of being an architect or an engineer, but what I can tell you is um, from a, um, you know, a technical perspective, several things need to happen uh, to decarbonize steel. 
Um, and so those technical pathways are, are things like uh, clean hydrogen production. Um, this is something that is really just at the pilot stage of being uh, applicable within the steel industry. There are um, a handful of global pilot projects um, in, in, in Asia and Europe um, that um, are focused on essentially uh, figuring out how to produce hydrogen one cleanly um, and then two, um, being able to use it uh, in, in uh, the industrial heating process to displace coal effectively. Um, and so um, over the next 10 years, um, there, there really has to be some major advancements and breakthroughs in terms of that, that particular technology. Um, carbon capture and, and sequestration as well, some of those pilots are further along. Um, and, and there are several promising uh, pilots within, um, within uh, China specifically that are exciting in terms of the scale and, and, and operability. Um, but again, that would um, have to be applied uh, you know, in a really strategic way so that it didn't prolong the life of um, blast furnaces longer than they, they needed to be um, and eventually could be replaced um, by, by cleaner uh, industrial heating technology. Uh, clean electrification. So I mentioned, you know, as, as um, EAFs have grown over the last many years, they're expected to continue to grow as more scrap is available globally. Um, and so, you know, further electrification through EAFs and, uh, clean, and, and, and clean electricity being used for those will be a natural uh, or an important uh, uh, natural lever as, as a part of the, the, the decarbonization of global steel. Um, I've about one minute. Oh, my Thank apologies. Um, was it keeping track of time? Um, additionally, material efficiency is going to be one of the most important weapons for construction um, and uh, architects specifically, um, how to reduce overall use of steel inherently within design, um, and then other mitigation and, and reduction uh, pathway, uh, pathways. Um, I'll, I'll skip ahead to... Um, a little bit about kind of build back better or green recovery agenda um, and, and these slides will be available afterwards of course as well. Um, so some of those things that we're asking for are um, to put heavy industry at the top of every green recovery agenda globally um, and, and set that, um, that agenda towards a 1.5 degree trajectory. Um, and one of the most important things as a part of that is our need for dramatic investments in research, development, and deployment of some of those breakthrough technologies I just mentioned. Um, clean procurement policies as a part of that. Um, conditions and on, on companies receiving aid um, and, and climate target setting um, and protections for workers in nature. Um, in terms of uh, project specification, uh, demand uh, for EPDs, um, that's something that you can do as a designer um, for both the products that you are requesting and um, from the facilities that you're buying them from. Um, get your company um, and your firm to align and commit to um, Carbon Positive's uh, framework uh, uh, and, uh, and set 2030 milestones. Um, and then going beyond EPDs and asking steel suppliers uh, themselves for the same kind of company-wide commitments that Sam's company has signed up to. Um, and, and again, really thinking through how you will decarbonize your entire business strategy. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret and Sam. Um, we're unfortunately right at the end of our time for the session, but I encourage all of the attendees to um, go back to the Carbon Positive website and find your next session on the agenda, um, which you can see here. Um, and with that, again, thank you so much, Margaret and Sam, for your insights and your expertise. Um, and I look forward to seeing all the attendees in a future session. Thank you. Yep. Thanks.